One, two. Good morning. I'm happy to have you with us today. It is um, leap day. Everything went ahead an hour, but I'm happy to see our, our Bible class did pretty good. We could have used a few more in Bible class, but they probably slip in, and that's okay too. Um, last week, during the sermon, I made a mistake, okay? Um, I've lived with this my whole life. I'm extremely dyslexic. And uh, God will tell you, I go over things constantly. Last week, the ains and the ins got me, okay? Jonathan and Nathalian, Nathan, okay? Jonathan and Nathan, they have the same ending. So I'm going to automatically do what with them? I'm going to mess them up. And I said Jonathan when I should have said Nathan. Okay? So excuse me for that. People will make mistakes. Jerry called me. How many of you remember Jerry? Raise your hand. Wow. I'm not on the radio television. Okay. There are a few people that remember him. He called up and he wanted the newsletter. Okay. And in my head, he and Brian look a lot alike. So for what, a couple of years? I would call Brian Jerry and Jerry Brian, and I almost did it on the phone. And I had to remember, wait a minute, I'm not talking to Brian, I'm talking to Jerry. So when I make one of those mistakes, please forgive me. Uh, you can tell me after the sermon. Uh, don't interrupt me during it, okay? Um, and I'll get it right, or I'll bring it up the next week, okay? You are daily assailed by empty words, idle small talk, advertising slogans, news reports that play on fear rather than report the news. Political and business leaders spew chants and cliches and they spin it to meet what they want it to say. King David was only too familiar with such afflictions. When one comes to see me, he said, he utters empty words while in his heart he gathers iniquity, which means sin. When he goes out, he tells that sin abroad. That's Psalm 41, verse 6. That's the theme for today, empty words. You know, our Lord's powerful words was David's refuge from vain and malicious talk. It is your refuge as well today. The law and the gospel are our stay. They are our mainstay. The Lord teaches us how we should live, and the gospel reminds us that when we don't live up to what the law says, God forgives us. So let us begin today, God of grace and God of glory. We'll rise on the last verse.
O Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us. And when one comes to see me, he utters empty words while his heart gathers iniquity. And when he goes out, he tells it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. They say, a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where he lies. We are all like at all sinners. We are guilty of sin. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. Still, our Heavenly Father invites us to return to Him and to seek his forgiveness. The gift of God is eternal life. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbors in our thoughts, words, and actions. We have rebelled against your rule and reign. We know our guilt. We know we deserve the punishment of death, but we seek your abundant mercy on account of Jesus. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us. And it is for his sake that he forgives all of our sins. He took the punishment that was ours. He endured death for us. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You are pardoned. We are set free from sin because of Jesus. Amen.
The Lord be with each of you. Let us pray. God, whose glory is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray and from your ways, and bring them again with patient hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. We ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated, and we'll have our lessons at this time. A reading from Psalms 52, 1-9, uh, through 9. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all the words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name, for it is good in the presence of the godly. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. A reading from James 3, 1 through 10. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they may obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they have, are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze uh, by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of right unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and yet and still on fire by hell, or set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison with it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in his likeness, in the likeness of God. For from the same mouth come blessings and cursing. My brothers, these are things that ought not to be. Lord, have mercy. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Henry. If you would please rise for the gospel. The gospel for this Sunday is recorded in the gospel according to St. Matthew. The, 50, uh, the 26th chapter, we begin with verse number 57. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going to 
And the high priest stood up and he said, when they had testified that Jesus said he would tear the temple down and build it up in three days, that they had had the answer and that Christ had blasphemed. Now, the high priest and the whole council were seeking testimony to find him guilty. And the last two witnesses came forward and gave that testimony. O oh Lord, have mercy. Deliver me, O oh Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. In you, O oh Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not. O oh Lord, my God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand would be seated please and let us um, go to our sermon hymn. My pages don't want to move forward. How firm a foundation. God's grace and his peace be with each of you today through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Okay, dyslexia had nothing to do with the gospel reading today. I am missing in my copy.
the big one, the whole middle section. And so I got to a point and I said, wait a minute, that doesn't come next. And so I paraphrased the rest of it. Um, dyslexia is extremely aggravating. Um, tutors who didn't know what dyslexia was back in the 50s. And uh, they didn't know how to deal with it. And the high school, the junior high school, and then later on the high school principal, um, it was my tutor. Oh, and I hated that. To sit there and, and, and read it line after line after line. And um, it didn't work. Education was difficult. I could learn, but I couldn't read. I couldn't spell. I still can't spell. I can read, though. Okay, so I, I eat up at least two books. Ask Dot, she'll, she'll tell you. I eat up two books a week, um, not counting the church stuff I do. But back then, that was hard. And there are so many young people today who still suffer from dyslexia. And I wonder sometime if it's not genetic. Because my middle, my last daughter has it, and her son has it. Um, and imagine not being able to read the Bible, to read the Psalms, some of the most beautiful, most beautiful uh, poems ever written. But they're not like the poetry that um, Europe, Europeans are used to. Uh, they don't base themselves on rhyme, but they base themselves on parallelisms. There are seven different forms of Hebrew parallelisms, and uh, it really makes them really neat. Revelation that we're studying in our Bible class uh, uses a lot of Hebrew poetry in it. Uh, and some of, our, some of the um, Gospels use it as well. In, in John, it says what? Do not judge lest ye be judged, right? And then the next verse says, do not condemn lest you be condemned. Okay, that is uh, synthetic parallelism. You say it one way in the first line, then you build on it, make it stronger in the second line. So it doesn't mean you can't call into question someone's actions. Basically means you can't condemn them. Who is it that condemns? God, not us. But you can judge their actions. Okay? And, and so, but to not be able to read the Bible, it, it is, it, it's really something else. Especially, especially Psalm 41. Now, today we're dealing with verse number six. And David says, when people come to see me, they speak empty words. In their heart, they're planning iniquity. That means sin. And when they go out, that's what they spread in their conversations, that iniquity, that sin. Jesus had the same problem. One day, uh, they came to Jesus and they said, Teacher, we know you're from God. What do you think about this? Okay, uh, They were doing it to try to trick him, to, to, to cause him problems. But they started out by saying, well, we know you're from God. Empty words. You hear it all the time. Empty words. Our English language is bombarded with empty words. In our daily conversation, we use empty words all the time. Hey, good morning. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. And, and two minutes later, you haven't even remembered who you were talking to, okay? In our greetings, in our conversations, we use a lot of empty words. When I was working for Matt, um, they had this thing up, and it listed who, where you sat as far as sales was concerned, okay? 
And the big thing was to make the president's club and get a reward. And you could see it. Well, I hope you do good today. That's what you're saying. But in your heart, gee, I hope he misses every single sale so I go up the list. Okay? Those are empty words. Advertising. Advertise and listen to the television. You want to talk about empty words. I sit there and I listen. I say, that ain't right. That's not true. There should be a rule about false advertising, especially with these um, Yahoo drugs that they have. You know, you get this and your hair is going to grow back. Sorry, it ain't going to happen. Um, you lose your hair, it's not going to grow back because you buy Mr. Jones's snake oil. Okay? Well, this medication and that medication. Uh, they used to have drug peddlers that would go to the doctors and they would peddle the drug to the doctor. Now it's being peddled on TV and you're supposed to go to the doctor and get him to prescribe that pill for you. Okay? But empty words. Empty words. Politicians, there's another one. Okay? You want to talk about empty words. They promise you one thing, when you get them into office, they what? They do just the opposite. Empty words. There are pastors that preach empty words. Oh, I forget his name. The miracle water. You call us and we'll send you miracle water. Well, he does. He sends you the miracle water, which his daughter went and bought over at Costco. That's where the miracle water comes from. And then in the letter it says, to get this so it works, to activate it, you have to send us 1995. Okay? So there's always empty words. I grew up with empty words. I grew up in a, in a church that taught me that if I went to that altar after confession and said 50 Hail Marys, and five pasternostras, and five acts of contrition, I'd wipe my sins away. No matter how many rosaries I do, no matter how many Lord's prayers I do, no matter how many, many creeds I do, it's not going to wash a single thing away. There's only one thing that washes sin away, and that's the blood of Christ. And Dot's telling me I'm off base. Okay. So it's Christ that takes my sin away. Not, not if I say all these prayers. You know, and that's why you never hear us saying during confession and absolution that you've got to go do something. Empty words when it's you who have to do it. Empty words. They're there all the time. Jesus, like David, understood empty words. Now, how does that apply to us? Well, we have been baptized into Christ. That's what we've been talking about during these Lenten sermons. Because you were baptized into Christ, you put Christ on. You cover your sinful life with the righteousness of Christ. You put on Christ. You become part of his death and part of his resurrection, according to the scriptures. So when David is praying this psalm and recording it, he's writing down what he is prompted to write by the Holy Spirit. And most of it applies to Christ. But because it applies to Christ, it also applies to us. For we have been united with Christ through our baptism. And empty words that David experienced is the experience of Christ 
and the experience of us today. How many people use empty words when they converse with us? Are they sincere? Is what they're saying concrete? Is it strong and lasting? Or do they tell us one thing to our face and then out in that sin-sick world, they're moved by that serpent to spew lies and contradictions. David was betrayed by people he thought were his friends. Christ was betrayed by people he thought were his friends. Look at Judas. Here at the table, he's saying one thing, and then he goes to the high priest and sells Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. His words say he cares about the poor. Why, this could have been sold for 176 denarii, I think it was, something like that. And it could have been given to the poor. It wasn't that he wanted to give it to the poor. He was stealing from the money box. He wanted it for himself. Empty words. Peter, Lord, I will follow you anywhere, even unto death. And then what did Peter do? I don't know him. I never heard of the guy. But surely you're one of him. You're a Galilean. I do not know him. Peter said one thing, and Peter what? Did another. Empty words. How many times have we sinned when we said to our Lord we would amend our sinful ways? Empty words. And it is for those empty words that Christ went to the cross. It is for those empty words that he shed his blood for us. It is because of those empty words God had to allow his son to be your propitiation for sin. That sacrifice that only he could make. All because of empty words. Has a close friend ever hurt you by what they've said about you? Have business acquaintances lied to you about business? I can remember that a handshake meant a lot. And in many cases today, even contracts don't mean very much. And you expect a person to be honest with you, and they do something dishonest. Has that ever happened to you? That's empty words. But when you run into that, we need to stop and look. And we need to ask ourselves, what about my empty words? Have I always been truthful? Have I always honored what I've said? Or have I tried to get over as well? Empty words. But the most wonderful, the most precious thing about those empty words about that sin is that in Christ it has been eradicated. It has been done away with. He died for my empty words. When I was 16, I went into the mill and Mr. Shepherd was the junior high principal at that time. And um, I totally was not 
not able to um, learn. I just couldn't learn the way the schools were teaching. And so um, at 17, my dad signed me into the Army. My reading level was barely enough to pass me through. Mr. Shepard worked hard. But like I said, he didn't understand what was wrong. He hadn't determined what dyslexia was at that point. A librarian in Germany started me off of comic books and gave me a book by Andre Norton. It's a writing team, a husband and wife. It's a science fiction book. And it's written on a very low uh, reading scale. And I started reading it. And then he helped me with words because I see words differently than other people. I see letters in different arrangements. And he taught me how to read the word, not the letters. And I took a test, got my GED, and started taking college courses. Well, some years ago, I was in Rhode Island, and I was preaching at uh, Greenville that Sunday. And so we went Friday night to a clam cake bake. Now, I know most of you don't know what a clam cake is. It's a hush puppy with white flour, not cornmeal, filled with clams and clam juice to make the paste. Then it's deep fried, and it blows up. And it is just unbelievably good. Well, this gentleman came up to me, pushed in a wheelchair, and he said, do you know who I am? I said, no. He said, I'm Mr. Shepherd, and I am so pleased that you were able to learn how to read and that you're a pastor in the Lutheran Church. It requires a four-year degree and then a four-year master's degree on top of that. Most churches give doctorate's degrees, and at that time, I had 30 hours towards my doctorate degree as well, but he was so pleased and happy that I was able to overcome the dyslexia. Not empty words. Not empty words. And he couldn't come the next day that Sunday, but he said he'd come the next time he was able to, when I was back. Two weeks later, he died. But he was so overjoyed that I was able to overcome it. But I haven't overcome it. No one overcomes dyslexia, really. We learn to live with it. Not empty words. It's a gift of God. Because I'm able to read the word of God. And I haven't found an empty word in that in the last 44 years of studying it. And I still have to study it. I find new things all the time as I read God's word. I found one the other day, but I'll only share it with those who are in the Revelation class when we hit chapter 7. Okay? And it's something really neat. But if I hadn't read it, and realized what was happening, because most of the time we gloss over it. There are no empty words in God's word. Every one of them is jam-packed with meaning and hope and forgiveness. The Bible is a love letter from God to us. It has no empty words. If you'll read it, and meditate on it, you'll come to understand it. Whether you're dyslexic or not, God's word is vital to our existence in this world. There's going to be a lot of people spouting empty words to us. 
And they're going to go out afterwards and they're going to say all kind of things against us. But God's word is never like that. It promises forgiveness. It promises mercy and grace. And it gives it to us. No empty words. No vile. No lies. No condemnation. His mercy and grace is there. And how wonderful to be able to read it. And if your grandkids cannot deal with reading because they have dyslexia, guess what you can do? You can read it to them and then have them read it back to you and help them to be able to learn what a word is rather than how it's spelt so that they too can enjoy the blessedness and the hope that God's word gives. The world, the politics, the television, the advertisement, the newspapers, it's all filled with empty words. But God's word, his Bible, is the only thing that we can rely on for the fullness of the truth of a loving and a caring God. David found hope in the words of Christ. Peter found forgiveness in the word of Christ. What have you found? I pray that you found exactly what Peter and David found. That in the word of Christ, your hope lies. And that it is his truth from beginning to end. And that your life in the word is filled with hope, with mercy and grace. And that you come to understand what I did. That with God, there are no empty words. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay. Um, if we could please uh, receive the offering. We're getting down to the end of Lent, and we're going to start adding, uh, we're going to start using um, the first setting and page 5 and 15 again, which is the uh, fourth setting uh, of the uh, new hymnal. So we're going to start adding them back in. We will be using the um, offertory sung, and we'll be using more of the communion service. Uh, these are abridged services we're using right now under the um, Lenten series that we do on Sunday during Lent rather than the midweek. And so they use different things. And I know, I know it's, it's hard for some who grew up with the doxology at the end of the Lord's Prayer to, to deal with the fact that it's not there um, because that service that it comes from doesn't have it. And then in a lot of the lectionary, uh, lectionaries, the liturgies in the old hymnal, remember the old red one? Um, they have litanies. And in the new hymnal, there's only one litany, and I can't find it. <laughs> and it's in that litany that the doxology <coughs> is left off. Um, in the old book, there were several litanies, and the doxology isn't there. In the new book, they've added the doxology into it. And so we will be using the Lord's Prayer. Every so often, we'll slip back, and uh, instead of saying trespasses, we'll say sins. And just to remind us that when we say forgive us our trespasses, we're actually saying forgive us our sins. Okay? So let's rise for prayer.
Um, Jerry, uh, who I told you about, who some of our members still know, is not having a, a healthy time right now. Some years ago, he had several heart surgeries. And he may have gotten a little case of uh, COVID, and I'm not sure about that, but he did get ill. And um, he's very much concerned with being around people and everything. Um, his wife was healthy and took care of him. And unfortunately, something happened and she was okay today and two weeks later she had passed. And Jerry, still with heart problems, still with uh, problems about being around people because of his white blood count, um, is going along. And I think it's been almost two years now yeah. uh, since she passed. So keep him in your prayers. Um, he is, um, you, can get his, you can get his address from us if you'd like to write him a, a letter of encouragement or send a card. Uh, that would be something good to do, okay? So let's first open by praying for him. Most gracious God, we place Jerry before you, trusting in your grace and your mercy for him. Give him good days, Lord. And hear our words, not empty words, Lord, but words of hope for him. He's having some surgery coming up for his valves. And Lord, help them to work this out and do a surgery that is productive for him, that will help him to be able to live his days to your glory. Lord, in your mercy, for Jane and Gerald, are shut, who are shut in, keep them in your mercies, Lord, in those tender mercies. Make a blessing for them. We ask that you would be with T.C. Sullivan. He's having back problems. And now Linda fell or, or hurt her leg somehow yesterday or Friday after we talked. And I was looking forward to see her, but because of the injury, she's debilitated at the moment. Place your hand of healing upon that leg and strengthen it. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our for our nation, Lord, it is so fractured. It's not the way it used to be. People could disagree and then they go get a beer or go get coffee together. But nowadays it's so vile and so, so hateful. We remember those days. But this land is not going to be healed until those people are, who are called by God's name will be willing to humble themselves, put aside their party politics, repent of the national sin, and turn away from it and cry out to God. Then he'll hear us, but not until. As long as we live with empty words, there is no hope. It's the truth, Lord, that we need. Your truth. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. our church, give it the courage and the fortitude to stand up for the word of Christ, 
for the law and the gospel and the blessings that come through it. Help us to reach out and make a difference. Lord, in your mercy, for Melanie, who will be having surgery on the 13th and the 27th, for her eyes, Lord, you heal the eyes of the blind. And we know that you use medicine and the doctors. Paul had a doctor, Luke. Use Melanie's doctor to make a miracle for her. We know that those eyes can be healed. Help them to heal, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, for Deborah and Don, for Tony and Kelly who are celebrating birth uh, anniversaries on the 12th. Bless them on their anniversary, Lord. Strengthen them and help them to gravitate back, Lord, to your church. Without you, there is no hope. But with you, all things are possible. And we invoke your name in strengthening them in their faith and in their commitment to their church. Lord, in your mercy, for Austin and Brittany, for Marcus and Nicholas, bless them and keep them, Lord. They serve us in the military. Make a blessing for them as they go in harm's way. Keep them safe as they stand their watch. We also pray, Lord, for those in need Those who are mentioned in our hearts, Lord, you know their names, you know their needs. Reach out and bless them. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all of those for whom we pray, trusting in your grace and praying that prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, Lord. Now, the grace of God, our Heavenly Father, the salvation that we have through Christ our Lord, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. If you would, please be seated and let us close by singing, Lift High the Cross.
join us again next week for our revelation class and for worship but i would encourage you that live in the area to come and be with us in person god's blessings we'll talk to you next week